was just talking about <laughs> actually made me tear up a little bit. I'm like, dude, she's awesome. No. So, my sobriety date is September 6, 1994. My home group is a way out based like study in Tannersville, Pennsylvania. And my sponsor's name is Mike. Yeah, I got a guy sponsor, but he's really old. I swear there's no funny business going on there. Um, I, can't, I can't express my gratitude for being invited to um, such a wonderful conference with such wonderful people. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Like, you all talk my language, and it's language of the heart. And, like, I, I, and I'm awkward, I'm shy, I'm like, I'm the girl who's in the corner, you know, like with the book, like pretending that I don't see anybody because I don't know how to talk to you because I'm full of fear at times. Because, you know, there are times when I fall asleep dreaming that I'm awake. And then when I'm in a new place and I, and I don't know anybody and I don't know anything and I don't know where I am and, you know, it, it could be really overwhelming. An angel has made me feel so, so, like, taken care of and so a part of and Like, I'm just walking around chit-chatting, you know, talking to the ladies, you know, being completely, completely inappropriate and having a wonderful time. Um, so I want to thank you for having me here. I want to thank you for your hospitality. Um, 10, 11, and 12. I mean, like, <laughs> that's, that's a topic that can be talked about for forever, frankly. Um, there, these are, the way that I was taught to perceive these steps were that these were the dis discipline steps. This, these were the steps where we broaden and deepen our personal experience with God. <coughs> the steps prior to this are about sweeping away the things that block me off. Those channel, that channel that is blocked off between me and my higher power. And that these steps are about developing that intimacy, developing that relationship, developing that sense of community that I didn't have or I don't have when I'm stuck in self. Um, so talking about these steps, I mean, for me, I mean, I feel like the entire program of Alcoholics Anonymous and every principle and everything that we have talked about up until this point is encapsulated in this process. And this is the this is the design for living. This is the daily, this is what we do, and this is how we maintain our spiritual condition. This is how I show up and fit spiritual condition so that I can remain abstinent from alcohol, so that my mind doesn't believe that drinking alcohol is a good idea, so that I can be a recovered alcoholic, recovered you know, from a hopeless state of mind and body. Um, so I love talking about this stuff. And everybody, you know, like, it, it's weird. Like, it's real. I can tell you about my four steps. I will tell you about every BJ and every disgusting bathroom and a bus station. And I'm fine with that. And then I start talking about God and I get really nervous. You know, because I don't own that stuff. The girl who did that stuff, you know, 20, 25 years ago, she doesn't exist. But talking to you about my relationship with a higher power is something that is so incredibly intimate and personal. That for me, I'm like I get, I get, I get flabbergasted. I say, how do I, how am I going to stand here and share with you my experience about 10, 11, and 12? I mean, what is it that I can say to you other than you know, you actually have to have this experience in order to understand what it is that I'm talking about? You know, these are the steps, and it has, there's a line in the book, and it says that you know, we enter and live in the world of the spirit, and these are the steps where that happens. This is where the fellowship of the spirit occurs, because this is where we can talk to one another, and we can never see each other. We can sit there and have a, this house-on-fire conversation about God and AA and absolutely connect on a deep, guttural level in 10 minutes because we have a common understanding. We have a common peril and a common solution. So when we talk about this, when I'm talking to you about 10, 11, and 12, I'm talking to you about these things that show up for me every moment of every day. So... There's mechanics, yeah, there's instructions. I mean, this book has a, a million instructions. In fact, there's like, I, I forget, we're at 200 and something musts and rules and things like that. And I'll briefly touch on them. And the fact is, is, and this is the truth, is that if you don't have a sponsor who's bringing you through the work, then I can spit instructions at you all the time. I can say on, you know, page 84, it says this and yada, yada. It won't mean anything to you. Because don't let me read your big book for you. You need to have your own experience with that. Because frankly, if you, if you had told me what having a spiritual experience and living in the realm of the spirit looked like prior to having that's a spiritual experience and arriving in the realm of the spirit, realm of the spirit I wouldn't have understood it. I, you, you would have been talking Greek to me. You know, it's like describing an orgasm. You really don't know what it is until you have it, and once you have it, you're never the same, and you want more of it. Well, that's because I'm an alcoholic and everything's, you know, two is better, ten is great. Um, 
but it, for me it really is like that. So I mean, I'll talk a little bit about what 10 looks like, I'll talk a little bit about what 11 looks like, I'll talk a little bit about what 12 looks like, but I really more than anything else want to talk to you about the spirit of these, these sets, the principles and the... I want you to leave here and say, you know what, I'm gonna, I want to spend an extra five minutes of meditation. I want you to leave here and say, you know what, maybe I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to my nightly review. I want you to leave here and say, you know what, maybe I should pause every now and again. What I want to do is encourage you to actually practice these principles. So I'm going to share my experience because I feel like that's the only thing I have to share. I mean, I can't tell you my opinion on this because, frank quite frankly, my opinion is useless. You know, what I can share with you is what happened to me, what these steps have done for me, and how I could show up here, a terrified little girl, crippled with selfishness and self-centeredness, and as a result of being awakened by this process, I can become a woman of dignity. I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. So, I mean, my story, you're going to hear that later. I mean, if I don't clear out everybody, I'm, it's already thinning out, the hood's thinning. But, you know, I have, I'll tell my story later, and you'll get understand a little bit better about what it is to be Carrie and how I got here. So I won't belabor that, except for to talk to you a little bit about the spiritual condition, you know, and, and about how about how there are times in my recovery, no matter how long I've been abstinent from a drink or a drug, that I have fallen asleep dreaming that I'm awake because I've failed to apply these disciplines in my daily life. If you want to ask an alcoholic why they relapsed after having had an experience with the steps, they will inevitably tell you that they stopped practicing 10, 11, and 12. They stopped praying, meditating, they stopped they stop pausing when agitated or baffled. Stop asking for the right thought or action. They stop watching for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. They stop picking up the phone. They stop asking God to remove it. They stop turning their thoughts. And all of a sudden, I'm off the beam and I don't know why. And I've fallen asleep and I don't know why because I've stopped doing the things that help to me to remain awake. Now, mind you, God is God. And God is so much more powerful than the 12 steps. I mean, I don't want to tell you that, that or tell you to worship the steps because that's just a finger pointing to the moon. The moon is the moon. I'm pointing to it. The steps are pointing to it. The fact that I'm pointing to it doesn't change the nature of the moon. God is God. And God is huge. But here's the deal. I lie to myself all the time. I'm forever lying to myself. Sometimes I lie to myself so much that I convince myself that I'm doing something incredibly spiritual, which is incredibly stupid. And I'll tell you exactly what it is. When JR was talking, I had to go get quiet because I wanted to be a really good speaker. And I'm, I'm, I'm amongst some really illustrious speakers, and I'm having a great time, and I'm listening to everybody, and I'm getting on fire, and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be that good. Wait, they're saying everything I want to say. Damn, they're doing this better than I am. Mm -hmm. I'm getting jealous now. I'm envious. I'm envious of Matt. He was great this morning. I'm envious of JR. He was great. I'm going to be envious of Mickey tomorrow night, I'm telling you. Because I'm an alcoholic and I compare my insides to your outsides. And so I had to go get quiet. I had to hit my knees in the ladies' bathroom, and I've done that more, more times than I can count. And I had to do that, and I had to ask God to put the words in my mouth and love in my heart and help me to speak the truth because I want to do the right thing in the right way for the right reasons. And that is what I'm talking to you about when I'm talking about the, these steps, these principles about remaining awake. That even when I fall asleep, there's like this alarm that says, boom. You're being selfish. This is not about you. Go do what you need to do. And yes, it's become second nature to me. Of course it has, because it's been 20 years of somebody yelling at me, telling me, Carrie, did you breath? Did you write inventory on that, Carrie? Did you pause, Carrie? How about trying to put the word pause everywhere, all over your house, so that eventually you start doing it? Why don't you set the alarm on your watch, Carrie, to every hour and ask yourself, well, where is my head where my feet are? You know, I have people who have taught me these things, so... As a result of it, these, this stuff has become a natural part of my life. It's a part of how I live and what I do. And I do it for one simple reason. If I don't do it, I die an alcoholic death. I don't do it because I'm a guru. I don't do it because I'm incredibly awesome. I mean, I am incredibly awesome, but I don't do it because of that. I do it because I have a first step. And my first step tells me that if I do not do or if I do not live this program to the best of my ability every moment of every day, I will inevitably pick up a drink. 
because I have to be willing to go to any length for victory over alcoholism. So it's really easy for me, and I and I got to tell you this: is that right in a four step, y'all think that's that's the scary part if you haven't done it, and it's not. The scary thing or the difficult thing is making that time when in early recovery, my family didn't want to talk to me. Um, I was pretty much homeless. I didn't have anybody in my life. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have a job. Um, I went to three meetings a day. You know, like my life was pretty darn empty, and I got to do, you know, lots of recovery. I got to, you know, prayer and meditation. I could do that for 75 hours because no one wanted anything from me, and nobody actually wanted to talk to me, and I had nothing better to do. The challenge for us is when, when our life becomes full again, because it will. If you do this, it's the power of attraction. Your life will become full. Your life will become full of all these things that God has presented and laid out for you. And then it's a matter of, am I going to prioritize this over the gifts that I have been given? Because if I don't do that, those gifts will go away. The children that I love, that I have raised, who have never seen me have a drink or a drug in my life, in their life, that'll go. The husband who loves me, who's at home with four children while I'm here hanging out, having a great time, that'll go. The job that I have, which is incredibly awesome, I have the coolest job ever. You know, I, I, I love my job. I, I walk into work, and I'm happy as a clam. I leave work, and I'm happy as a clam. I get called to see you next Tuesday, at least on a weekly basis, and I smile because I love what I do, and I feel grateful for the privilege of doing my job. I stop doing this stuff. That goes away. All of the things that have been given to me by virtue of a loving, loving higher power, will be removed from me if I cease to prioritize this. And these steps are about maintaining that priority. So the fact is, is that, you know what, you're not going to do a good 10 step if you don't have a good first step. And if you don't write a sufficient four step, you won't know what you're looking for in the 10 step, frankly. And, you know, quite frankly, you won't know how to do a nightly review because, again, you won't know what you're looking for. So every step builds up to the next step. So the ideas and principles that were presented in step one have everything to do with step 12. Everything to do with step 12. Has everything to do with why I pick up my phone even when I'm tired. It has everything to do with why I'm willing to clean up the vomit in the backseat of my car because I drove somebody to detox because I got a phone call. And that's what we're supposed to do. That I'm responsible to be there, the hand of AA. And when, that ha when, when AA or when that person reaches out to me, I can't say to you, I'm too busy. Yeah. So, talk a little bit about 10. 10. Uh, let's see. For me, 10, it doesn't say if. It says watch for. So this implies that I'm going to be self, that I'm going to be dishonest, that I'm going to be frightened. This step is not about perfection. It's about maintaining that connection. Maintaining those lines that I just opened up between me and the power greater than myself. I did all of this work, and it would just so suck if I did all of this work, and then I said, ah, I'm just going to let this totally atrophy and ignore it. And so this connection that I built and this reliance and dependence that I built, it's entirely meaningless to me. Okay. So, it says if, not when. And this step is about maintaining present conscious contact with my higher power. My head is never where my feet is, or feet are. It never is. When, I, when I'm disconnected from God, my head is out here, and my feet are wherever they are. And I'm always projecting I'm either in the future or I'm in the past. And this step is about recognizing when I'm not where my feet are. When my mind has wandered off of this present moment, when I've begun to play God again. Because that's really what that's about. Is about me falling asleep to the fact or the idea that I am a child of God. And when I fall asleep to that, then I start doing things like planning and deciding. And then planning some more. And then I start planning for you. And then I decide what's good for you. And then I tell you. And you didn't even ask. And then I start getting mad at you because apparently you were offended because I told you what I thought was good for you even though you didn't ask. And apparently I did it in a very offensive way. 
And then all of a sudden, all, all, of that, all of that good, nice, warm, gooey feeling that I had is gone. And what I have is a sense of alienation and aloneness, right? Because that's really, when we talk about that spiritual malady, when we talk about what that looks like, that's a separation between me and you. The things that I put between you and me are the things that God is removing through this death process. And that sense of a, alienation and alone is the thing that I put alcohol in my body to kill. Because for me, and this is just my experience, that I'm terrified of you. I'm terrified of what you're going to think of me. I'm terrified of what you're going to do to me. I'm terrified of what I'm going to do to you. And when I'm in that state, it's primal. And there can be no you and me. There's that wall that I need to have between you and me. And that wall keeps me sick. That wall keeps God out. My experience has been that the light of God shines better for two windows than one. Meaning that I can have this wonderful experience with God, but if I'm not having it with you, I'm not having it. I'm mentally masturbating. Because that's really what that's about. If I'm not sharing it, if it's not a community thing, if it's not about us sharing this beautiful experience together, and I'm keeping it for myself, I have my spiritual experience, and I'm going to stay home, and I'm going to hang out, and I'm going to do all my stuff, and I'm not going to deal with those people because they're annoying. That's me mentally masturbating. You know what happens? It goes away. So, 10 is about making sure that that doesn't happen. You know, I watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment appear. When, not if, they occur, what do we do? We ask God to remove it. So I watch, I ask, I discuss. You know, we forget the discuss part. That's the one, like, my sponsor was a stickler about the discuss, because the discuss is in humility. See, because if I keep the selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear between me and God, and I just ask God to move it, and then I don't talk to you about it, there's no humility. I get to decide, and I get to be the arbiter of my conduct. And if I'm not supposed to be the arbiter of your conduct, I'm certainly not supposed to be the arbiter of my conduct. Just saying. So then I get to keep it in my little head, and I get to massage it, and grow it, and manipulate it, and decide, and plan, and then tell. So, you got that one word, discuss. Discuss is really important, because that's when it turns this experience of watch and ask into not being in my head, but being an action that I take, because I discuss, and then I turn. So I watch, I ask, I discuss, and turn. Seems pretty simple, right? <laughs> it's probably the hardest thing we're going to do because guess what? These are the, the, doing this goes against every part of me. Part of it, it goes against my nature because the fact is is that looking at me and at what's truly going on inside of me, that petty, icky stuff that we talked about, it's not something I want to do. I don't want humility. What I want is for you to think I'm really awesome and humble, while I'm actually not humble at all, and pretending to be something that I'm not. Pretending to be this incredible spiritual giant, because I have these nuggets that I put out, and I can quote the big book, and I've done fish steps standing on my head while spinning tops and plates and all kinds of things, and all these newfound crap that I make up, and things that I add, and exercises I do, but I'm not willing to tell you about the silly, stupid stuff that I think about or things that I respond to inside of my head, and I'm not willing to humble myself to do that. And guess what happens? We get really, really darn sick. So we ask, and then we discuss. And if you notice something in the night review, it asks us, it says, is, did, I, did I hold something back? Was there something I should have talked about with another human being? Because I'll tell you what, the thing that I struggle with most, more than anything else in the world, is a relationship with myself and a relationship with you. I can't have a relationship with you without a relationship with myself. I can't have a relationship with myself without a relationship with a higher power. Because lack of power is my dilemma. I have to find a power by which I can live, and it has to be a power greater than myself. So I have to gain that access to that power in order to begin to develop this relationship with myself. By virtually doing that, I begin to develop the relationship with you. When I'm in untreated alcoholism, I don't have relationships. That's not what's going on. What's going on is control. I need to control you for me to feel safe. The tenth step is about me making sure that that doesn't happen in my life. And if it does, to know what to do about it. So all of the things that we talked about in the third column, in the fourth column, the amends, all of that stuff 
is being brought to bear in just these few little steps. And they're incredible. You know, I love that JR talks so, in such great detail about amends. Because, I mean, a lot of times we just say, oh, you know, made amends. But we don't talk about how or what or what they might look like. And for me, and my experience was, I started, I was told to start working the 10 step. I've been trying to work the 10 step in my fourth step. Because I was told that this is something that I need to do when I start cleaning up the wreckage of my past. Did I do the 10 step well in my fourth step? No. But you know what? The fact is, is that I became, I started to develop the discipline of watching, asking, discussing, and turning. By the time I was halfway through my ninth step, this process, this little thing, this little 10 step, this little pause, this little watch, the little ask, the little discuss, and turn, started to become a habit. It became a part of how I just conducted myself in my daily life. And it's funny because there are times when I'd be sitting in, I'd be sitting in class, and of course I got sober at 18, so by the time you know I went to college shortly after getting sober, and I'm in class, and you know, I would turn to somebody in class and just say, you know, I'm really frightened with taking this exam. I'm projecting that I'm going to fail, and I'm deciding an outcome before it happens. Am I going to win? <laughs> okay. Thanks for sharing, Chair. You know, we don't have to like look for the perfect vessel to discuss. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting present with the people who are around us. You know, so. We do this. And what happens? I mean, the best promises of the book are concentrated in these three steps. We have the 10 step promises, which promises me that I will be placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected from my obsession to drink. That I will recoil from it like a hot flame. My experience has been that's true. If I maintain my good spiritual condition, alcohol is no different than bleach to me. It's something I really shouldn't put in my body. And that's the way it is. It has absolutely no power over me if I do this. Is it easy? No. So one of the little tricks of the trade that I learned was index cards. I love index cards. I write inventory on these, by the way. I have a purse full of them. So I have a tumor that I'm waiting for a biopsy to come back on. And when I, when I come home in about a couple days, I'm going to go to my doctor and I'm going to find out if I have cancer. So I was sitting in receipts today. Well, Matt was talking about cancer, and I'm like, God damn it, will you just stop talking about it? Like, I don't want to think about it. Like, I'm here in Nebraska having a good time. I really don't want to think about whether I have cancer. Damn it, won't you stop talking about cancer? So I pulled out my little notebook and said, I guess I need to write some inventory on that. So I sat here very quietly and wrote the inventory on this little diagnosis that I'm waiting for. It doesn't have to be some tremendous thing that we do. It can be some very simple things that I do to keep that channel clear. Because quite frankly, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have heard the rest of what he had to say. Because I, all I would have been hearing is cancer, 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 cancer. I had to get present in that moment. I lost that presence because fear came up. It will come up for us, guys. It's going to come up for us because we're human beings. This is not about perfection. If it was about perfection, sorry, just checking my time here. I'm not texting, I promise you. If it was about perfection, then we could have just stopped at nine. Made amends. Okay. Just don't do it again. But it's not about that. This is a continuous process. This is where we develop and we broaden and deepen this experience. So I have little note cards. I have words pause, watch, ask, turn, <laughs> discuss. I mean, I put them in my car, I put them in my purse, and I put them on my door, I put them all over my house. I have a friend who makes labels. He's like crazy about labels. And one of his favorite things is what I want doesn't matter. Um, and, and every time I would call him up complaining, I'd cry. And I'd be like, but you don't know what they do to me. And he'd say, Carrie, what you want doesn't matter. Did you pray? Did you write it into it? No? Then I don't want to talk to you. Like, And it really helped me. Because what it did is, it, one, it forced me to use these principles. It forced me to, to submit to this process. It forced me to be disciplined. And it didn't allow me to rely on him to make me feel better. Because we do that. We rely on human power. I do that because I'm human. So I have these little cards and I put them all over my house. Pause, watch, ask, turn, discuss. I have a little alarm that goes off my phone and I do this at work. I'm a therapist. I hear some of the most horrendous stuff that you'll ever hear in your life. And I do it every day, all day long. 
So think about it here in a fifth step for 40 hours a week. My brain gets a little itchy after a while, right? So we have 50 minute sessions. Like we say we do it for an hour, we don't do it for an hour. We have 50 minute sessions. So what I do is my phone is set to go off five minutes before the hour. And then it asks me to just get quiet for a second and say, is my head where my feet are? Do I need to check in with God? Where am I with God? Am I present to this moment? It's a very simple thing to do. And I stop and I say, am I thinking about today? Am I thinking about what's going on right here, right now? Am I concerned about something that is absolutely none of my, none of my business? And then I can practice this and I can go, okay, well maybe I need to step outside and grab a co-worker and say, you know what? You got a minute, I have a 10 step. It's a beautiful thing. I do it all the time. I have 10 step buddies. I have people that I text and call, and I'll text them and say, do you have a minute? Do I have a 10 step? And we, we hold each other accountable. You know, what we do is we've agreed to not shoot each other bail. And I'm not allowed to call up and go into the drama. and like, didn't you know what my husband did? And blah, blah, blah. I have to call up with my fourth column. <coughs> I'm not allowed to go into the whole icky, icky, icky stuff. So I call up and say, I'm being selfish and self-centered. I'm placing expectations on people. I'm playing God. I'm being demanding. I'm acting like a child. And um, I'm being dishonest. Is there anything I can do for you today? I love it. It's such a freeing thing. And it's just this deal we made with each other. And it's like, we're not going to keep each other sick. We're going to help keep each other well. And so this is part of what we do. Because I would rather kick dirt on your feet than... Dump the dirt on your grave, and that's the way it is. So it's not about how you feel or you liking me. It's about whether or not we're going to die of this disease or whether we're going to live in the sunlight of the spirit. I can live in the sunlight of the spirit. I can have this incredibly beautiful life, but I have to be able to maintain my spiritual condition in order for me to fully experience this wonderful, beautiful life. Because what happens to me is I worship my mind. My mind tells me all kinds of things that really don't make any sense. And so the idea here is I fall asleep and I start worshiping my mind and I start worshiping my thinking. I start worshiping my emotions and I lose track of why I'm here. I lose track of that gratitude. I lose track of that first step. I lose track of that desperate, that gift of desperation that I was given in my first step. So we do this. When I retire at night, right? It's part of step. Everybody thinks it's the 10th step. That's actually the 11th step because it says. Literally, here it says, you know, this brings us to step 11. Then it starts talking about prayer and meditation. And the first thing it starts off with isn't prayer and meditation. It actually starts off with an inventory. Now, think about that for a minute. So Bill doesn't start off a, a, a step that's focused on prayer and meditation, but he starts it with an inventory. Why? Why? Because inevitably I'm going to do something in the course of my day that maybe I fell asleep to, that at night I can get conscious of and be willing to face and be rid of it. I need to bring this into meditation. So well, when I do this nightly review, and I do it with a pad and a pen, I do. I've been doing it with a pad and a pen for, since I was 23 years old, 15 years. I need that because I lie. And, you know, and it, it doesn't have to be this long, drawn-out thing. You know, I don't have to do this year, live, extended third column, extended fourth column, turn around. I don't have to do that. I mean, I, sometimes I do. But typically, I can just answer a stupid question. There are 12 questions. It's very simple stuff. Was that enough? Was I dishonest? Was I selfish? Was I frightened? You know? And I love it because, it, because I was taught, and this is the thing about the 12 questions, is one of the most beautiful things is, like, I have to answer them honestly, and I can't answer them. By the way, it's on page 86, if you don't know what the 12 questions are. And that's part of what we call the nightly review. Originally, the, the first 100 alcoholics actually used to do it in the morning as part of their quiet time, you know, the Oxford group quiet time and meditation. Bill moved it to the night. I figure, I don't care when the hell you do it, I just want you to do it within 24 hours. I mean, honestly, I don't care. You can do it in the toilet. I know people who do. Like, seriously, they're like, look, I take a dump once a day. I have a notebook and a pen, and that's where I do it. And if that's what's going to get you to do it, I don't care. God doesn't care. I just 
just went to the bathroom in, a, in, a, in the women's in the ladies' room and hit my knees and prayed. This isn't about being, you know, aesthetically pleasing. This is about saving my ass. And this is what this is about. So if, if, if you poop once a day and you need to be reminded to do your nightly review once a day, put it in your bathroom, man. You know, I won't tell. But it ha- we have these questions. Was that example? Was I selfish? Was I dishonest or afraid? Do I owe an apology? That's a huge one. Do I owe an apology? Right? And it says, have I kept something to myself that should have been discussed with another person at once? And it says, at once. You know? So I'm supposed to be doing this at once. When I, well, as soon as I realize that I'm asleep, I'm supposed to connect with you. Because there's power in numbers. The two of us come together, and that is the, that is the power of God is working. When it's me thinking about myself, that's called alcoholism working. I need to do that. I need to have that humility. I need to have that connection. I need to have that human interaction. It keeps me honest. It just does. Because if I'm thinking about where all of this stuff in my head without talking to you about it, solitary self-appraisal self and suffice. That's been my experience, and that's what I was told, and that's what this book says. So the idea is that I'm supposed to look at that and say, was there something I should talk about at once? I love this one. It says, were we kind and loving toward all? So there's no percentages there. I used to do percentages. I was 50% kind and loving. Kind is in my actions, love is in my attitude, by the way. Just kind of like will and life. You know? So there's no percentages. It's a yes or no damn question. So usually it's no. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but, but it really is. It's a thing that I need to be honest with myself. Was I kind and loving? You know, and, and if the answer is no, then it's no. And then I need to go back to the first answer of the questions and say, why? What was I doing? Was I carrying judgment? Because that judgment is what separates me. That judgment is what separates you. That judgment is what keeps me sick. That's the judgment that, tell, that has me think that I'm better than you or that I know something more than you. And that judgment pulls me out of God's grace. So I might be nice to your face and thinking all kinds of things in my head. And I need to be honest with myself about that. And I need to, need to be honest with myself about that because typically it shows up in my behavior and I'm delusional about it. So I'm acting like a jerk. I think I'm being nice. And the reality of the situation is I'm being a jackass. And I'm calling it being kind and loving. You know? And so we need to take a look at that. It says, and I love this, what could we have done better? That's a beautiful question. And that's the same question. And it says, you know, I believe in the fear inventory it says, what, what should I, oh no, it says, um, what would God have me do? And then we got, or what would God have me be? Sorry. I was just discussing that earlier. So what would God have me be? And then in the conduct inventory, it says, what should I have done instead? And this says, what should I have done better? Because I'm always supposed to be learning. This isn't something that I'm just going to like wake up one day and be like, by the way, I'm entirely well. I have absolutely no character defect. And I am a sunbeam for God. And I'm absolutely never going to do anything wrong, stupid, or selfish. No. There's always something I could do better. And this is, a, and again, this is about the humility. This, these steps are truly about humility. This is humility in action. Not just that false humility that says, oh, shucks, I'm selfish. When I'll tell you the stuff that I'm selfish about that makes me look good and hide the stuff that I'm selfish about that makes you look bad because I don't want you to know that I'm a petty, egotistical bastard. So, uh, you know, we need to be honest about this. So that humility comes with this question. And it says, what could I have done better? You know, and that's sometimes I need to go to somebody, and that's why the discuss is so important. It's because if I've actually done this step, and if there's something I should have discussed, then I can actually pull somebody aside and be like, you know what, I'm blocked. I don't know what I could have done better. Can you help me? And it's amazing, they know. They know very well. And I get to learn and have an experience. And it says, was I thinking about myself most of the time? That's an important question, because that's really asking me, was I present in the moment? This is asking me if I was present in the moment, because if I'm thinking about myself, I'm not present in the moment. I'm stuck in self. So this is really asking me, am I present? Am I pausing? Am I where my feet are? Am I relying on God? Am I showing up as a woman of dignity and integrity? Am I doing what I say and saying what I do? Because if I'm thinking about myself, I'm inevitably not. And it says, and I love this. Was I thinking about what I could do for others? Was I being of service? And then what what could I, uh, it says, um, of what I could pack into the stream of life. And I didn't really know how to read that. And I've heard many, many different interpretations of it. And the way I look at it is this. 
And there's two ways I look at it. One, what I want doesn't matter. So what I'm resisting is an area that I'm unwilling to allow God to have absolute control over. It's an area that I still believe that I have some say in, or still believe I have some control in. And we call that an agnosticism. So when I'm trying to pack things into the stream of life, it to me tells me that I'm going against the flow of my life, the flow of God's will, and somewhere in, at some point I'm in collision with it. You know, because if I'm not if I'm not packing things into the stream of life, and I'm going with the stream of life, right? So then I'm going with God's will. So for me, it's about looking at and saying, "Hey, you know, am I trying? Am I deciding what my day is going to look like? Am I investing in outcomes? Am I trying to?" run the show? Am I moving against the flow of my life? And another way that I heard it talked about, and I love this too, was am I trying to do more than what I should? Am I trying to pack so much into my life and keep so busy that I don't actually get to be present or actually get to participate? Because I think we do that. We get so caught in doing things, we forget to live, right? So I was told, you know, I've heard many different interpretations of that statement. I like them both. I mean, I really like any way of looking at it. But for me, I really look at that as like, you know, how am I living? How am I relating to my life? How am I relating to God? And am I, am I really trying to fill, my whole, fill that hole in my soul with all kinds of human power? Am I at peace and at one with those around me and with God's will and God's universe? You no, know, and so we, we have all all of these things, and they say, well, you know, this after after all of this inventory, after all of this pausing, after after all these turns, after all these asks, and all of this other stuff, that's when we, we go into our quiet time in prayer and meditation. And again, that that we have some instructions. It talks about it. it says, you know, upon awakening, we you know we you know we ask God to direct our thinking. We have more instructions that says, you know, when we're agitated or doubtful. We, we talk about bringing our families into prayer and meditation, right? We said that this is something that we should do together. I've heard it said in, in, in AA, and, I, and it always drives me nuts, that we should keep our programs separate. You know, that my program is my program, and your program is your program, and never should anybody who's in a relationship ever discuss their program. That's not what my book says. My book tells me I need to ask in my morning meditation how I could be of service to the to my family. My book tells me that I should bring the, my family into prayer and meditation. That prayer and meditation should be something that should be shared, not something that I do secretly where you don't know. My husband and I have shared inventory with one another, but I will tell you not to use inventory or nightly review to passive-aggressively torture your spouse. That did not work out well for me. So be careful. It's like, it's like I have a piece of nightly review that I would really like to read you, honey. And you're on it. No. But having that humility and sharing that with somebody that you share your life with some, it is an incredible experience because in, there really is no there is, really is no separation. It's true intimacy. Because I'm allowing you to be a part of my relationship with my higher power. I'm inviting you into this process and you're inviting me into this process and it's something that we do together and something that we share and it's something where I can't hide or pretend to be somebody that I'm not. And I can't, I, I, my husband uses a term, he says that I can't be a predator posing as a house pet. And I like that one, you know. So we do this. We do this. We share this. I love using the Oxford Group Morning Meditation. I think that's incredible. The Quiet Time and Guidance. There's a wonderful book. It's non-conference approved, but you might want to check it out. You know, it's it's, you know, how to listen to God. There's also a pamphlet that comes out of Cleveland. It's called The Four Absolutes. I love The Four Absolutes because really the 10th step is The Four Absolutes in reverse. You know, God, you know, Bill knew that if he told us that we needed to be absolutely loving, absolutely honest, absolutely pure, and absolutely unselfish at every moment of every day that we would, you know, tell him to go shove that blue book up his behind. You know, so what, what he did do is told us to watch for the opposite of those things. So any guidance that I get anytime I go into prayer and meditation, anytime I get that, you know, that moment of being motivated and that sixth sense, that thing, I'll stop and be like, how well does this line up with the four absolutes? Is it? Because if it's not, maybe I shouldn't be doing it. 
So that's a wonderful litmus test for our prayer and meditation. It's a wonderful litmus test for our decision. I mean, these are things, these are all tools that Bill and the first 100 alcoholics gave us, and they're incredible things, you know? So I think I gave a pretty decent overview, and I'm sure it was quite um, arduous of 10 and 11. And I do that for a reason, is because I think that these steps often get missed. I think that everybody likes the 12 step because we all want to put on a cape and fly in and save drugs. You know, like that's fun. You know, cleaning up vomit and crazy drunken people and brawls on the front porch. I mean, that's, that's, <coughs> that was a Saturday night in the Cosgrove household. So, like, you know, me doing that now is not such a big deal. But it's this stuff, the mechanics that often I get stuck on. You know, I forget. You know, and I'm not telling you that you should be so hard on yourself that if you miss this or if you somehow, if you fall asleep, there was a time when I actually went three years without missing a nightly review or a morning meditation. But then my ego was so attached to the fact that I never missed a morning review or, ne- or nightly review and uh, morning meditation that my sponsor actually told me I was not allowed to do it for a month because he told me, he's like, hey, you know, you're worshiping the finger again, man. He's like, what, you're relying on prayer and meditation instead of God. He's like, you're relying on your actions rather than giving giving yourself over and surrendering to that power. It was a little scary that month. I will tell you that I was not very nice. I'm very grateful that he did that, and I'll tell you why. Because there was nothing between me and a drink. God. All of the mechanics and all of the things that I was taught to do in order to not pick up a drink, I was not allowed to do. I had to experience that gut-level trust. I mean, truly believe that God was going to do for me what I couldn't do for myself. So I'm not suggesting that you just knock off prayer or meditation just so, you know, saying, well, Carrie said, I don't need to do that. I just need to trust God. But I, what I'm saying to you is that these, well, everything that we're talking about, these are all just instructions, and, and they're wonderful things. I mean, like, look, when you go to Ikea and you get this big, beautiful desk that you put together, right? Do you frame the instructions on the wall and worship them, or do you use the darn desk? I use the desk. Now, the instructions are valuable, and I need to use them because I'm the kind of girl who just looks at the picture, and I end up with three extra wheels and screws, and my desk is lopsided, and then I want to know why it fell apart, and damn it, Ikea just makes a jump. Now, I don't follow instructions very well. So the idea is we want to do these. We want to practice these disciplines. Discipline is an incredibly important thing. It actually tells us that we ask God to discipline us in, in the way that we just outlined, meaning that on my own, I cannot produce the willingness to have this discipline, that this discipline is God-given. That for me, I ask God to help me to be a disciplined alcoholic. I ask God to please discipline me in the way that we just outlined because the fact is, is on my own desire, my own thing, man, I'm going to be a lazy, selfish self-righteous, drunken, pain in the ass. So I ask God to do this, and it tells us that. It says, it says we are undisciplined, so we let God discipline us in the simple way we just outlined. God is doing this for us. God is helping us write that force step. God is there with that force step, because it says we admit, it says, it actually says that, you know, God is in there. You know, I always thought it was about telling you, and I didn't realize that God was actually there until somebody pointed out to me that it says that we admit it to ourselves, and God, the exact nature of our wrongs, like not just somebody else, or admitted to somebody else, you know, like I didn't get that, like I, for me it was just about telling you, I didn't know that it was about also, you know, God knew that, because I, I, I never really thought about what God knew or didn't knew, know about me, like to me it was like God was that thing, he was an ATM, he was Santa Claus, like I just went up to him and said, I want this. You know, and when, when, when my sponsor had me read my four step out loud, to God, in a fist, he said, "Let's go home. Now that you did this fist step with me, I want you to go home and read this out loud. I want you to read this to God. I want you to get quiet, and I want you to read every darn word on these pages to God, and sit in that for a little bit. See how that feels. There was an incredible vulnerability. One, it felt really weird talking to myself, and then there was an incredible vulnerability with that. It was an incredible vulnerability. So God disciplines us in this way. If this is about God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves." So there's work I have to do, absolutely. But that, that genuine sense of desire to be near to God is produced by God, not produced by me. 
Because honestly, the truth is, guys, is that, you know, this stuff, God is an untenable, unknowable thing. And when we think about it, when we talk about it, we use all these words, we use these letters, and we use these concepts, and we have all these books, and we have all these people talking about this thing that none of us can really truly know, except for the little piece that we experience. So honestly, I look at it, and I truly look at this, like that little spark inside of me that exists, that alcohol and alcoholism was not able to completely annihilate, is seeking communion with that spark inside of you, and that spark inside of you, and that spark inside of you. And that in itself is greater than all of us. It seeks communion. It seeks community. It seeks the fellowship of the Spirit. So this is something that God does for us if we allow it, if we get out of the way of it. Like, you ever think about it? Like, you ever just sit next to somebody and you're not saying anything? You're just sitting there and you're happy. There's nothing to say. There's absolutely nothing to do. But just the presence of being next to that person feels good. You ever have somebody in your life that's like that? Is it possible the God inside of you and the God inside of them are having a conversation that you know absolutely nothing about? That's been my experience. You know, so we let God do this. And if we do this, we get to, for me, I get to stay awake long enough to be able to carry a message to those who are suffering. Now, here's the deal. My first step was somebody else's 12 step. My 12 step was somebody else's first step. If I am in the 12 step, I am always connected to my first step. I never fall asleep to the idea that I am an alcoholic, that I am powerless, that I cannot manage my own life. I don't, I don't lose contact with that idea that is a present reality for me. You know, I had a sponsor who told me at times that if there's, if there's something that I'm balking on, I should put a bottle of booze next to my big book and ask myself, which is easier, dying alcoholic death, live on a spiritual basis. Guys, if you're in the trenches, you know what dying an alcoholic death looks like. You never lose sight of that. I see that every day. I don't know how many people have died this year that I have personally been involved in their 12th step in some level. I don't ever lose sight of that. But here's the deal. We get really selfish, and our life gets really big. And I started off talking about that, saying that, you know, 10, 10 or 11 is really about making sure that I don't get so attached to things in my life that I start worshiping them instead of worshiping the power that gave them to me. And I don't know how many times I've been in a woman's meeting, and there'll be women in there with their nails done, with perfectly frosted hair, and I'm sure they have wax vaginas, and they say, I don't have time to sponsor. I have a very, very busy life. I have Pilates on Monday, and I have yoga on Tuesday, and Wednesday I go to my Oprah book club, and then I have to get my hair, and I have to go to the gym, and I have all these all these engagements, and I just feel like I did my time with sponsorship. Now I see them drink, and sometimes they make it back, and sometimes they die of their arrogance, and then I get to say, what was it that you stopped doing? 10, 11, and 12. Holy shit. Big surprise. Because the most incredible selfishness that any one of us can manifest is, a, is an unwillingness to be able to, to bring this and be able to care about and have the empathy. And that's the word I'm looking for, the empathy. To have the empathy to carry this message to the sick and suffer, suffering alcoholic. You know, we get sober so long and we're so happy, joyous, and free that we forget that there are people dying. And they're inconvenient to us. And they smell. And they interrupt our meetings. I know, because I've brought drunk people to meetings and people have thrown me out. And I say, they're like, they're drunk. They don't belong in an AA meeting. And I say, well, maybe you don't. Because uh, that's exactly where this person should be. Maybe you should go home. I I'm not really, I haven't been invited back to that meeting. You know. But... This is honest and true. So if we do this deal, if we practice these principles, if we do just a little bit that I'm talking about, and like I said, more than anything else, I wanted this talk to be good, but we'll, we'll the jury's out on that one. Um, and I talk really fast, and my brain is crazy. But what I wanted you to do is to, to kind of walk, walk away from this or listen to this and say, hey, you know, maybe there is something I could be doing to broaden and deepen my experience with the 10 step. Maybe there's something I could do that can broaden and deepen my experience with step 11. Maybe there's something that I can do that'll make me more committed to step 12. Maybe there's something that I can do that'll make me walk up to that person that doesn't look all that pleasant. 
and be willing to have that conversation with them. You know, I'll kind of wrap this up. I'm almost, I'm, I'm almost at, uh, out of time, but um, we talk about the the, uh, the benefits of doing this. You know, a lot of benefits. You know, um, 20 years of sobriety, a happy marriage, happy children. Haven't thought about killing myself in 18 years. Haven't thought about killing anybody else in seven. Um, <laughs> you know, but one of the things, and I'll talk about like a miracle of healing. I'm somebody who like experiencing an incredible amount of, you know, I guess what you would call trauma. I certainly would have belonged on like Jerry Springer, or Oprah, or something, right? You know, like physical abuse, sexual abuse, thrown downstairs, rape, all kinds of icky, 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 icky stuff. Like a whole laundry list of stuff. Came to AA, really messed up chick who carried knives, not a happy camper, violent, feral would be the word. Um, spent two years here dying. Somebody finally introduced me to the steps, had this incredible spiritual experience, got on fire, and things are amazing, right? I go through the steps again and again because I've been taught to do that. My, my, I was taught, how free do you want to be? What are you willing to pay up? What are you willing to let go of for freedom? Because spirituality is not about addition, it's about subtraction. It's about what am I willing, what ideas, concepts, attachments am I willing to let go of that will allow me to experience God in a more universal way, in a more deeper way. I don't know how else to explain it. Like, guys, it's so hard to talk about this. I could talk about, yeah, my sex life easier. Um, but here's the deal. So... I did this work a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of times. Got free of a lot of stuff. One of the things that I got to do as a professional um, and as a therapist is I got to work with sex offenders. Think about that for a minute. So I'm a girl who's like, you know, beaten and raped and all kinds of bad things happen to her. Definitely a lifetime movie level of stuff. And I'm working with sex offenders. And when I say I'm working with sex offenders, I mean that they're my patients. One of the things that therapists we have to have is empathy and compassion. And I'm talking to these men who have done some pretty icky, icky things to animals as well as other creatures. And um, and I could see the light of God in them despite what they did. I didn't see their crimes, but I did as I saw the human being. And to me, when we talk about doing this work, we talk about why we did this or the benefits of doing this. I do this so I don't drink and die. But one of the things that I'm gifted with more than anything else is an ability to see the light of God in any, any creature, any human being, anything, and experience that. You know, did I, you know, let them touch me? No, I'm not stupid. But I did see God in them. And I did have compassion for them. And I wasn't angry at them. I was able to be of service to them in a way that I didn't know I could be. And that's not because I'm awesome. I'm a great therapist, but it's not because I'm awesome. It's because God has taken away the things that kept me from having that intimate contact with you. And when God has removed those things because it's about subtraction and has allowed me to wake up to the fact that no matter what you have done, no matter who you are, you are a child of God, and that is a fact. And it's something that I have centered my life on. It is absolutely something that I know with the deepest fiber of my being. That there is nothing that you can do that can erase that fact. If that fact is true for me, it's true for you. Whether you're Jeffrey Dahmer, Jack the Ripper, or a housewife, we're all children of God. And when I wake up to the experience that I am because of this process, because of what we're talking about, I wake up to the fact that you are, and I can live that way, and I see the world. And one of the things that I ask in my morning meditation is that I can see the world through God's eyes rather than my own. Because if I can see the world through God's eyes, love's eyes, rather than my own, then I get to see you in the way that I want to see you, with compassion. And when I see you with compassion, I see me with compassion. I can't have judgment on you and judgment on me. And I can't have judgment on me and judgment on you. If I surrender those ideas and surrender those concepts and live in compassion, I'm happy and I'm free.
but I have to let things go. And the things that I have to let go more than anything else are what my idea is about who you are and who I am. And I do that through this process. I do that through the 12 steps. And I maintain that through 10, 11, and 12. I deepen that through 10, 11, and 12. Um, I hope that I gave at least a decent synopsis of these principles. I hope that when you leave here, you get your big book and you talk to somebody who has an experience with it. I hope that you say to yourself, maybe I might want to try some weird, weird meditation. I want to take that class. I want to do that thing. Because you know what? There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing that is better than having an experience with a power greater than yourself. And whatever we have to do to have that experience, I mean, I would fall over broken glass for a bottle of booze. Why wouldn't I be willing to sit for 45 minutes and meditate? I mean, think about that. I mean, that's a, that's a ridiculous thing. I crawl over broken glass for, glass for booze, but, I, you know, prayer and meditation, I don't got time for that. That's not how this works. The, what I'm willing to put into it is what I'm going to get out of it. But I really want to thank you for having me, and thank you for letting me share. Shall we circle up and say this for Andy, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.